I began work on this paper uh, in the middle part of last year, it was going to be in an early draft form. It was a very <coughs> different paper with some fairly conclusive ideas arrived at after tracing out some of their intellectual genealogy aided by Ed Sloak, by some of Father Sylvain Laroon's works, and by Ashley Kapoor's fascinating and, and recent work on authority and power in uh, the Byzantine tradition. But I set that all aside. Uh, and what you have here is a very different paper, um, very much in the uh, original French sense of an essay. Je vais essayer quelques idées. I'm going to try out some ideas here and see what you think. And so I very much look forward to our uh, discussion at the end, particularly to uh, the amendments I suggest to two of these canons here from the last <coughs> show, uh, which I'll come to in just a moment. Um, if you'll forgive a word of autobiography, I set aside that original plan for the paper uh, because of the events in the Catholic Church in the last uh, seven months in particular. Uh, as an undergraduate uh, psychology student in Canada in the 1990s, I wrote my first paper uh, on child sex abuse in the Catholic Church. And I thought that nothing could be more shocking than what we learned then of the demonic horrors at Mount Cashel Orphanage in St. John's, Newfoundland. But I was wrong. The events of the past summer with the revelations of ex-Cardinal uh, McCarrick, with the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, and with reports emerging in Honduras, Germany, Australia, Argentina, and seemingly every place in between, have shaken many of my hitherto rather blithely accepted ecclesiological convictions. And so what follows in this paper is an attempt to think my way towards some new approaches to the twin problems of power and obedience which bedevil hierarchical organizations like the Catholic and Orthodox Church. In sum, I shall argue that we need desperately to be far clearer about what my nursing colleagues would call the papal scope of practice as we search for and nail down a delimiting definition of primatial and other forms of power in the church, including episcopal power. Moreover, and perhaps more controversially, I shall argue that we also stand in need of serious re-examination of the notion of obedience. On this latter point, I will be drawing on both classic and contemporary psychoanalytic literature, including a fascinating new book by a Spanish Jesuit priest and uh, psychoanalyst, Carlos Domenegos Morano. Now, I've been told by some that discussions of power are unsavory and out of place in the church as the divinely constituted body of Christ. Uh, that, of course, only awakens in force my unapologetic Freudian instincts. To be told not to talk about something is always a sure sign <laughs> of a reaction formation and other neurotic defense mechanisms. The everyday practices and discourses that make up what Foucault called the microphysics of power can be found just as commonly in the church as in many, any other major organization. And an unwillingness to admit this must be seen in ecclesiological terms as a species of crypto-monophysitism, and in psychoanalytic terms, as a manifestation of an ecclesiolo ecclesiology of illusions in the strict Freudian sense. In either case, what is preferred is some fantasy in which the church somehow seems to flow freely above all supposedly mundane notions and vulgar political practices of power, the admission or even discussion of which would somehow render la bella figura of the church scrofulous and shabby, reducing her from the glories of beauty contemplated and celebrated in, say, Chartres or Chive, to grubby, glad-handing antics in Trump Towers. But the Catholic Church today can no longer afford such self-indulgent romantic fatuities as pretending there is no need to discuss power. Now, more than at any point previous in our history, this discussion is an imperative which cannot and must not be escaped. And to its credit, the Church has not shied away from discussing power, at least as far as the corpus of its canonical legislation is concerned. The two codes of canon law, the Latin Code of 1983 and the Eastern Code of 1990, both openly and almost cheerfully use the word power and its cognates and discuss its application, extension, retraction, limitation, and correction in considerable detail, at least as far as concerns so-called lesser institutions in the Church, like the diocesan episcopate. When it comes, however, to the discussion of the powers of primacy, the codes are strikingly reticent, as are other relevant sources, including the conciliar decree Pastor Eternus of the First Vatican Council. While that council and all subsequent discussion in canon law and in the text of Vatican II repeat the same four phrases about primal power, primatial power, that is, it is supreme, full, immediate, and universal ordinary power, 
those terms are themselves left strikingly and problematically undefined. As argued elsewhere in detail, this lack of definitional precision creates a vacuum in what I have come to call the Catholic imaginary, which is then filled with all sorts of psychologically suspect desires and expectations, and with real life practices as well, all of which have done great harm to the Catholic Church and thrown up extremely serious obstacles to rapprochement with orthodoxy, as we all know. Now, there are arguably healthy and unhealthy reasons for this reticence. In Freudian terms, there are both latent and manifest reasons. Manifestly, we know from conciliar history that the decrees of most major and ecumenical councils tend by their very nature to leave a great deal unsaid, specifying only what must be made explicit to satisfy the demands of the crisis at hand. As Bulgakov said of Chalcedon, and to some extent also of Nicaea too, we know what the no is, but what is the yes? And contrary to its reception and perception, in its legislation, Vatican I, I would argue, is a council of no at least to the larger maximalist ultramontane hopes of, for example, a Manning or a Von Sinister. More recently, as David Bentley Hart has put it, one of the great virtues of the Roman Catholic approach to doctrinal pronouncements is that in their official formula, these pronouncements are often so scrupulously pure of detail that they are capable of a vast variety of theological receptions. Hart held that up in reference to the modern Marian pronouncements, that is, of the Immaculate Conception and of the Assumption, and he saw it as a virtue, as indeed it can be. But it can also be, and often is, with regard to doctrinal pronouncements about the papacy, the condition for a vicious vacuum, too. As many historians have shown, that the powers claimed at and after Vatican I are only intelligible as a reaction to the French Revolution and the other revolutions of 1848, leading up to the laws of the Papal States in 1870. But the Catholic Church, especially since the modernist, the so-called modernist crisis of the pontificate of Pius X at the turn of the 20th century, likes to pretend as though les dogmes n'ont pas d'histoire, <coughs> in a phrase attributed to uh, Louis Cardinal Billot. It generally prefers to portray doctrinal claims and developments as having no history, as completely unmoved by the events in the so-called secular realm of politics, lest that realm be thought to taint the claims of the doctrine. As a result, the claims of Vatican I are rarely discussed in their context and never presented as the indisputable reactions they are to the depredations of the French and later re the European revolutions. Such reticence slyly allows people to continue unchecked in their pious assumptions that the modern centralized papal cult of personality is some deep and long-standing part of so-called sacred tradition, going back thousands of years and having nothing to do with grubby politics, but being instead some sort of species of pure, pristine theology. When, of course, these claims are highly revanchist developments, clearly expressing what D.W. Winnicott famously called hate in the counter-transference. But as we know, the emphasis on centralized papal power and universal jurisdiction is a very recent development, and one more urgently in need of critical examination and change than ever before not just for ecumenical reasons, but also because of the damage it is doing to the Catholic Church internally. For these reasons, then, we must face squarely the issue of power, in particular, primatial and papal power. To focus our discussion, I want to proceed in the following manner um, and draw your attention here to the, uh, the two canons that are, are on the screen um, and look forward to your thoughts to my proposed amendments to those canons in our discussion. I would ask you to consider whether those additions in uh, italicized boldface here uh, would make these canons, if not entirely acceptable to orthodoxy, then at the very least far less worrisome. I do so, of course, because changing canon, changing canon law, while difficult, is relatively easy compared to the virtually impossible task of trying to do anything with uh, Pastor Ternus other than just gradually hope that we forget it. Uh, if these vaguely defined canonical terms, that is, supreme, full, immediate, and universal ordinary power, in the words of Canon 331 in the Latin Code, if those terms are a problem for Orthodox Catholic rapprochement, would the limiting clauses I put here help? Is this a sufficient scope of practice, or would more need to be done? In other words, if we amend Canon 331, to say that the Pope can exercise his power in those circumstances where irredeemable conflict has not been resolved by local bishops or regional patriarchs, or where such are unable to act because 
for example, of state interference or persecution. Would that be a sufficient uh, scope of practice around that canon? Uh, and then coming to canon 333, um, would the changes proposed there uh, also remove some of the anxiety about uh, seemingly unlimited papal power? In other words, uh, the Pope has that power, but it is never used except when those particular churches are catastrophically impeded from governing their own affairs. Um, and then I add, for reasons I'll get to in a moment, uh, an additional clause at the end of that canon, um, uh, ensuring that the bishops themselves, because there's a history of them doing this, uh, may not surrender their own proper power to the Pope and may not be superseded by him except with the unanimous written consent of all the bishops in the metropolitical province. Again, I'll look forward to your thoughts on that later. Now, let us say um, that uh, such changes were possible and even were enacted. That would not uh, necessarily remove the problem of papal power being abused, nor would it touch the other issue that I want to look at, which is the question of obedience. Um, and particularly the abuse of, of both claims, uh, examples of which we, we have in uh, many, many forms. And so it is the uh, problem of obedience that I want to, uh, 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 to turn to now. As this latest phase of the sex abuse crisis in the Catholic Church was emerging uh, in the summer of 2018 and is still ongoing, uh, it quickly became clear that one of the unexamined factors allowing men like Theodore McCarrick to remain a predator for so long was the power of obedience in one-on-one -on -one relationships. More recently and more broadly, we saw what I can only regard as an unseemly display of this in November, when the American bishops met to devise a plan for facing the crisis, only to be told by a late night email from Rome to stand down, which they meekly did. An action that put one in mind of Bismarck's famously arch observation of the bishops after Vatican I as the Pope's postman. This particular incident raises all sorts of questions, and in search of answers, I have found help in what many might disdain as the least likely of quarters from Freud and three of his followers. Eric Fromm, uh, who died in 1980, Adam Phillips, who was still alive, and the Spanish Jesuit priest and analyst Carlos Dominguez Marano. All have written many works which we cannot delve into here, so I'm just going to quote from um, uh, particular works of theirs on the theme of, of power, obedience, and authority. One of the recurring themes in Freud's work from his penultimate period, which I would date from 1919 to 1927, is the complicated relationship human beings have to authority, especially authority that is either divine or makes claims to know and teach about the divine. In his 1919 essay, A Child is Being Beaten, his 1924 essay, The Economic Problem of Masochism, and above all, his 1927 book, The Future of an Illusion, Freud saw again and again in his patients and in cultures at large the secret, sometimes tortured, craving people have for omnipotent paternal authority figures to both dominate them and rescue them. This need not, Freud says, rise to the level of an explicit perversion, his work, or even of sexual fantasy. He says, and I quote, doubt remains whether the fantasy ought to be described as purely sexual, nor can one venture to call it sadistic. But no doubt remained for Freud, based on his clinical examples, that this craving finds its origin in attachment to the father. That attachment is bound up with what he would call moral masochism, which typically involves the placing of the self at the disposal of what he calls impersonal powers, the papacy being an extremely clear example of this, I would suggest. And the motive for doing this, Freud says, is almost invariably unconscious guilt, or to use another phrase he finds somewhat less problematic, a need for punishment at the hands of a parental power. That parental power stirs up the felt need for, pun for punishment by cultivating an often extravagant sense of the parent's own long-suffering patience with wayward or intransigent children. I would argue that papal history has numerous examples of this, and we've just heard several. <clears throat> uh, and I would suggest that such dynamics are at work in the actions of bishops under Pius IX in the 19th century, who cleverly manipulated media images of himself as suffering in the Vatican because of Italian unification and other vague but nefarious plots 
to play on the guilt and need for resultant punishment in bishops outside Italy, especially in the free world, who gladly then and as recently as November 2018 have submitted to him out of some unhealthy sense of obedience. In other words, there is some kind of psychological need that is felt and met by surrendering one's own responsibilities and powers to another, especially if that, ha uh, that other happens to be a domineering paternal figure, as by all accounts, Pius IX certainly was. The search and longing for father figures is the central uh, psychological desire exploited by the modern papacy and aided by the modern episcopate in the Catholic Church, <coughs> leading to the modern Catholic imaginary in which the Pope is omnipotent, <coughs> omniscient, and omnipresent, and to whom the only response is one of obedience. Three of Freud's followers have picked up and extended his examination of this problem. I begin with Eric Fromm, uh, who was one of the most prolific and, and uh, far-reaching of Freud's followers, a prominent mid-century social critic, often associated with the Frankfurt School and, and Adorno, uh, who possessed what one of his biographers, Lawrence Friedman, has called a prophetic voice. Many of Fromm's books, uh, and he wrote many, uh, begin with psychological theory, but then seek to move into the realm of practice and of politics in search of a better and more loving and more personalist world. I focus only on one book here, uh, Escape from Freedom, which was published in 1941 uh, and was a huge international bestseller at the time. And in that book, Fromm speaks of what he calls uh, people having an instinctive wish to submission, for submission to internalized authorities. Uh, Fromm was of Jewish background who managed to escape Europe in, uh, just in the nick of time to land in New York. And he's writing, of course, uh, in the context of a world at war with various forms of totalitarianism. But in this book, he saw no reason to distinguish between those who had submitted to Hitler and Mussolini in Europe and those in America and elsewhere who were submitting to compulsory military service. In other words, his point was about the human psyche in general without political or theological distinctions. I take him then to be making a point as applicable in the Catholic Church in our time as he was anywhere else in 1941. It seems to me in this light indisputable that within the church, the laic, to use Athanasio's term, have been bred to submit to clergy, clergy to bishops, and bishops to popes. Seminarians fear for their future. If anything, even hinting at disobedience is seen by their rector and his formation team. Postulants and consecrated religious alike are inculcated to submit in obedience to their superiors. Perhaps, perhaps, in a healthy church, this works and need occasion no comment. But we are not living in a healthy church. And in a church hemorrhaging so massively, this bias towards obedience has led to the inaction of all the orders, the league, the clerics, and the bishops. The assumption, even at this late hour, is still, bizarrely, for the Pope to do something. Hence, everyone is standing around waiting for this much-wanted summit next month in Rome. The Pope, we seem to think, is the expert on all matters Catholic, and he alone has the authority to act, especially if bishops are involved. And to that authority, we're all supposed to submit. This bias towards internalized papal authority shared by Catholics is subject to further scrutiny by two contemporary psychoanalysts. Uh, in his 1995 book, Terrors and Experts, Adam Phillips argues that psychoanalysis can be useful as a critique of the whole project of wanting authorities and experts to save us from ourselves and to solve our problems. And to his credit, Phillips turns this argument right back on Freud and the whole tradition to say that at its worst, psychoanalysis and psychoanalysts have been just as authoritarian as anybody else. Um, uh, Philip says that psychoanalysis uh, is useful when it seeks to both comfort and unsettle. I would suggest that the uh, psychoanalyst for Catholics who most unsettles and discomforts us now in our pathological habit of papal obedience is, curiously, a Jesuit priest. Carlos Dominguez Morano, uh, in August of last year, his belief after Freud, religious faith through the crucible of psychoanalysis was published in an English translation. I regard it as a stunning book, um, the best theological engagement of Freud that I've come across, um, and I can't do it justice here. I will just simply note that it's already in its fifth edition in Spanish, and I think it deserves a wide Anglophone audience. Now, Jesuits, of course, are famously vowed to an additional fourth vow of direct and immediate papal obedience. 
So to my mind, it's all the more powerful to see this son of St. Ignatius hone in on precisely the notion of obedience in the church. And he doesn't pull his punches. He directly attacks it. He says obedience has to be regarded as, quote, the elevation of infantile submission to the category of a theological virtue. Where does this psychopathological idea of obedience as submission come from? There is doubtless a long and wide-ranging psychohistory to be written here. In his recent book, The Church, Authority, and Foucault, the Australian Anglican Stephen Ogden has argued that the church continues to suffer from living under what he calls the spell of monarchy and the sacralization of obedience. The virtue of Dominicus Morano's book is that he breaks the spell and desacralizes obedience by plainly admitting that the freedom of the kingdom of God has been replaced with the church as what he calls an authoritarian system which, by using authority not as competent service, but as domination, has generated fear and feelings of guilt quite alien to Jesus of Nazareth's message and what his message should inspire. So what is the answer to all this? Morano goes on to argue elsewhere in the book that one of the key lessons of the earthly life of Jesus, vis-a-vis -vis his mother and stepmother, is especially revealed in the incident where they find him teaching in the temple at the age of 12. He says that this example shows us how to overcome the problem of earthly fathers and their claims to power over us. And I quote, any type of paternal projection on other social figures must be overcome. Nobody on earth can claim paternal authority. Nobody can exert paternal power or protection in the Christian community. If we refuse such power and paternal functions, we do so, he reminds us, because Christ tells us in John's Gospel, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. Those who are called to be friends with God must learn to conceive him anew. Moving past paternal projections onto priests, bishops, and popes, and all the problems inherent in those, many of those so well described in the paper we just heard on the familiar relations between Rome and the East. We must get rid of this, Morano says. He goes on to argue, the Christian should not nostalgically search and long for the father. The father figure dwelling in the psyche of the person must be buried. Once it is, he goes on to say, it must not be resurrected by us in the secret and perverse ways we often do so. For, in the Christian community, it has to be stated, the place of the father should remain empty. Father, teacher, or director are not Christian words, insofar as they are used to describe a type of interpersonal relationship inside the community. Only God can take that place, he says. In the place of the rule of fathers, Morano goes on, Christians are called <coughs> to a community of radical equality. But such a community does not dispense with obedience, but instead reconceives it as a process, he says. Not easy, certainly, but a process of a joint search for God's will. That search, while allowing for different functions within the church, nonetheless takes place as a dialogue of brothers. How hierarchical traditions such as Catholicism and Orthodoxy could begin to live this more clearly is, of course, a very significant challenge. But as much progress has been made, as we just heard so lucidly, in abandoning paternal and maternal parental language and relations between East and West, we are not entirely without grounds for hope that the language of obedience will similarly be dethroned.